Uh, good afternoon and welcome to the 8th Annual James R. Soule's Lecture on the Constitution and Citizenship. Thank you for joining us. I'm David Redloss, the James R. Soule's Professor of Political Science and Chair of the Department of Political Science and International Relations. I'm pleased you're able to join us for today's lecture by Congresswoman Lisa Blunt Rochester. We're absolutely thrilled to have her here today. We're also honored to have President Asanis with us this afternoon to join me in welcoming you and our speaker. Uh, despite an unintended conflict with the university senate meeting, but very much appreciate uh, President Asanis being here. So let me invite him to offer his own welcome to our lecture and to our speaker, President Asanis. Thank you, Dave. Good afternoon, everybody. As the president of the great University of Delaware, it's a real privilege to welcome all of you to the Souls Lecture, and of course, uh, to welcome our fantastic uh, Congresswoman Lisa Brandt Rochester. Let's give her a hand. So uh, the Congresswoman has been a friend of the university uh, for some time now, many, many years. She was a student here, and she kept coming back for a lot of our events all the time. It was uh, recognized with the uh, highest honor in the College of Arts and Sciences, and I know we're going to see much more of her uh, in, in, in the coming years, as I can tell you today, she will definitely get reelected with your support, all right? <laughs> so, uh, so we're really honored, uh, Lisa, that you will be presenting this lecture. The, the lecture, the soul's lecture, as you all know, is meant to commemorate the legacy of uh, Professor Jim Souls. Uh, I've not met Professor Souls, but I hear from everybody that he has been an outstanding figure here at the University of Delaware in political science. And more than uh, Jim Souls, which is already a tall order, it's meant to celebrate and promote the idea that public service can be one of the most honorable professions in our society. Delaware is indeed fortunate to be represented by men and women who exemplify this idea. And UD is very fortunate to have many of them who have come to deliver this lecture from the inaugural lecturer who was nobody else but the Honorable Joe Biden <laughs> to today's guest, Congresswoman Lisa Blunt Rochester. So I know you're really eager to hear from Lisa, so let's welcome her to the podium. Thank you. Thank you so much. Absolutely. So much. We have a couple of comments first. Oh. <laughs> oh, a couple of other comments I'm sorry. first. I'm sorry. No, no, no. Little confusion on Little the agenda. Little confusion on protocol. Nothing, nothing but major. I give you back, back, yep. back to Dave. <laughs> Thank okay. you. We'll get this, we'll get this figured out. Anyway, um, thank you very much, President Asanas. We very much appreciate your coming here to welcome everybody to the lecture. Um, as President Asanas noted, the James R. Soule Lecture on the Constitution and Citizenship celebrates both our late colleague Jim Soules and Constitution Day, which is today, when we consider the role of the unique document that has guided our country for more than 230 years. One genius of the Constitution that is very short it doesn't try to define everything in detail. This has allowed every generation of Americans to interpret what the Constitution means for them. Yet some of those interpretations, we have to admit, have not stood the test of time, as our country has often struggled to find a place for every American within it. Yes, we have Brown versus the Board of Education unanimously declaring that separate can never be equal. But only three generations earlier, we had in Dred Scott a constitution that denied basic rights to many human beings. It took a civil war to overcome that interpretation, only to be replaced in just another generation by Plessy versus Ferguson, the case later overturned by Brown. We've always moved forward, I think, in fits and starts to put into practice the ideals that our founders put into writing. But we've often, uh, uh, and, and that, quite frankly, they often failed to fulfill. We continue to debate what the Constitution means just as the founders debated it right from the very beginning. The very fact that we can do so and that we can be here today to consider its meaning and purpose reinforces for me just what is so special about the Constitution. I personally am proud and humbled to hold the James R. Souls professorship. While I did not know Jim Souls, what I've learned about him makes clear why we celebrate his legacy with this annual lecture. As you'll hear in a moment, 
Jim Soles was amazing treasure for the department, the university, and the state of Delaware, as well as for generations of his students. Because of support from many of you in this audience, we can honor his important contributions through the James R. Soule Citizenship Endowment. The endowment funds a number of programs in the Department of Political Science and International Relations, including both undergraduate and graduate student civic engagement stipends, as well as an endowment funding this lecture. It's now my pleasure to ask Ed Friel, Senior Policy Fellow at the Institute for Public Administration, to give us some insight into Jim Soles and his lasting contributions to our university and to our state. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to say a few words about Jim Soles and why this lecture series came to be named for him. It is important as we move away from Jim's active time at the university in his passing eight years ago that we pause and remember what made him so special. Before I do that, though, I do want to thank, I know he's gone, but President Asanas for coming over and opening the session today. That was, that was very gracious of him and very much appreciated. I might also say that I am uh, thrilled by our speaker today. Uh, she's been a friend for a long time. We've had an opportunity to work together on a lot of different things over the years, and uh, I'm thrilled that you all are going to get a chance to hear from her uh, this afternoon. Uh, Jim Soles came to the university in 1968 and remained here as a member of the political science faculty for almost 35 years. His primary areas of academic concentration were the Constitution and American politics. He received the university's Excellence in Teaching Award twice and was, at least in my time, the only faculty member chosen by the graduating seniors to deliver their commencement address. Jim was famous for his courses encouraging students to engage in the world of politics and public service. His courses in the 1970s gave many students, including some of the folks in the room today, their first political experiences. A sidebar, he became known nationally for his one-man stage portrayal of founding father James Madison. In 1974, Jim ran for Congress, and while unsuccessful, the campaign introduced Jim to the broader Delaware community. He would go on to advise many of our state's well-known public leaders and to become our state's premier commentator-in-chief. Uh, Jim Soles practiced what he taught and ventured well beyond the walls of this university, serving on many boards and commissions, including leaving the Delaware Her leading the Delaware Heritage Commission and the Board of Delaware Technical and Community College. Most of all, Jim was a mentor to thousands of Delaware students, many of whom went on to careers in the law, government, and public service in general. As a number of the people in this room can attest, Jim was a great advocate who also knew how to apply a swift kick to a mentee in need of one. Near the end of Jim's career, Former students and friends came together to create and fund the Souls Foundation to support students in civic engagement. Since its creation, almost 100 students have received direct stipend support and assistance. In addition, the foundation supports the James R. Souls Professor of Political Science Chair, ably filled for a number of years by Dr. Joe Pica, who I think was mentioned earlier, is now the James R. Souls Professor Emeritus. Joe, Emeritus. Uh, and now ably filled by, by our, our department chair, David Reslosk. Uh, for those charged with developing a program to celebrate the Constitution, it was a natural to connect that celebration with Jim Soles and his lifelong commitment to the Constitution and civic engagement. A second fund was set up and funds raised specifically to support this annual lecture. As we leave today, after hearing from our distinguished Congresswoman, I hope we will also remain true to Jim Soul's love of our Constitution and the spirit of civic education that he championed. And with that, I will turn over the podium to uh, David and let him introduce our guest. Thank you, Ed. Thank you, Ed. I now have the distinct pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Congresswoman Lisa Blunt Rochester, who I'm happy to say is an alumna of the University of Delaware. Lisa, <laughs> let's applaud that. She began her professional career as caseworker for then Congressman Tom Carper. In this position, she helped people during challenging times with their social security benefits, disability insurance claims, IRS disputes, and housing needs. 
She then served in the cabinets of two Delaware governors as the first female African-American Secretary of Labor and the first African-American Deputy Secretary of Health and Social Services and State Personnel Director. As Secretary of Labor, she managed 500 employees and an $87 million budget. She focused on connecting employers to resources and job seekers. As State Personnel Director, she was commissioned to investigate the Delaware State Police for racial and sexual discrimination. The 2001 Blunt Bradley Report, developed with local and national experts in policing and civil rights, served as a roadmap to improve the internal and external relations of the State Police. Congresswoman Blunt Rochester also served as the CEO of the Metropolitan Wilmington Urban League, an action-oriented public policy research think tank focused on the inclusion of people of color. And she again made history in 2016 when she was elected to Congress, the first woman and the first person of color to represent the first state in Washington. She serves... <laughs> She serves on the House Committee of Education and Workforce as well as the House Committee of Agric on Agriculture. She grew up in Wilmington, graduated from Padua Academy, worked her first job at the McDonald's on Market Street. She majored in international relations at Fairleigh Dickinson uh, and later earned a master's in urban affairs and public policy from the University of Delaware. She has helped women enter the workforce in the Middle East, provided vaccines to children in Africa, and co-authored a book while living in China with her late husband, Charles. Her book, Thrive, 34 Women, 18 Countries, One Goal, profiles women who reinvented themselves while living in a foreign country. Please join me in welcoming our speaker for the eighth annual James R. Souls Lecture on the Constitution and Citizenship. Thank you, Thank so, you so much. much. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, First of all, to Dr. Asanis, in, in his absence, I want to say a huge thank you uh, to Professor Redlosk. Thank you so much for that introduction and for the honor of presenting me. Uh, Ed Friel, long, long, long time friend and mentor and former boss. He was my boss, as a matter of fact. Uh, I, I had to joke because we were in the green room and when Ed walked in, I was actually eating a plate of food and Ed has a story about me when, uh, we, when I was a caseworker, there was a pack of Oreo cookies in the middle of the office and there was one left and he walked in to reach for it and I almost chopped off his hand. So he has some fond memories of me. But I also want to thank the Board of Trustees, to the professors, the students who are in the room, and a special note of thanks to Catherine Souls Pomeroy and Julia, who is also in the audience, seventh grade granddaughter of Jim and Adelie Souls. Please give them a round of applause. And, and she tilts her head shyly, but the baton will someday be passed to you. So I dedicate my talk to you, Julia. I also wanted to um, acknowledge Jim Souls. For a, I knew Jim Souls. I got to work with Jim Souls. And so I will tell you when the opportunity to give this speech came, um, it, it's even written in my speech. I'm not a scholar or a professor or, or a constitutional lawyer but it was about Jim Souls, and I felt so inspired and so humbled to be asked. Um, you know, there are many things that are said about him, but one of the things that I noticed last night, I was looking at my old book by Celia Cohen called Only in Delaware, and he was one of the people who, you know, wrote a, a comment, a blurb on the back of the book, but he was called a great statesman as well. And I think that's what we need today, great statesmen and statespeople. And so, I wanted to highlight him and honor him, but I also want to honor Ada Lee Souls because if anybody knew Ada Lee, that was a force. She was quiet but mighty, <laughs> quiet but mighty. And so I am honored to join you on this Constitution Day to celebrate the 230th anniversary and its citizens past and present who have taken up the mantle to serve this great nation, as well as to pay tribute to Jim Souls, a celebrated leader and voice within the first state. George Washington once said, the Constitution is the guide which I never will abandon. Fortunately for our country, the framers wrote a pretty good guide. 
an ever imperfect but exceptional document whose core ideals have miraculously withstood the test of time. In fact, it is one of the few things in our republic to remain unscathed through the sands of time, the crises of war, and economic strife. If the Declaration of Independence laid out what we won't stand for, tyranny and taxation without representation, and what we do stand for, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, then the Constitution is the roadmap for how we get there. It's been able to endure because Washington and the rest of the 39 signers of the Constitution knew that this physical document embodied more than the sum of its 4,543 words. It outlined far more in American life beyond its seven articles. It is the product of passionate debate and compromise. It is the living, breathing manifestation of liberty, order, and peace. And with each passing generation, we have sought to improve, perfect, and to honor that document and our country. And we are better for it, and so is the world. The indelible impact of our Constitution is found beyond our cities and our small towns and farmland. It was a global statement, one that inspired other countries to strive for higher human ideals. Our Constitution set the example for the world to follow. And the fundamentals of the US Constitution, federalism, separation of powers, and checks and balances are the cornerstones of representative democracy the world over. What makes the Constitution lasting and meaningful is that it derives its power from the people. To quote Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, otherwise known as the notorious RBG, you, you got it, some of you uh, got that. We have the oldest written constitution in force in the world, and it starts out with three words, we the people. According to the Oxford Dictionary, there are over 170,000 words in the English language, but the founders chose to start with those. Think about the profound wisdom of that. Like the opening notes to a powerful song, it is the hook that immediately draws you in and lets you know what the song is about, or in this case, what the document is all about. We the people, we the people, y'all the people, we the people. Let us sink in for a minute and ask yourself, what does we the people really mean? It's one of the most obvious questions to ask when analyzing the preamble, and it's one that many scratching at the door of true freedom and liberty have raised. What about women? What about people of color? What about people with disabilities? The short answer is actually at its core. It meant the government derived its power from the people. It meant different things at different times. We have the benefit and wisdom that history provides us to acknowledge that our founding fathers, while deeply revered, were in fact human beings. And in being human, they were bound to the societal norms of a far different time. And to me, it only makes sense to interpret the Constitution through the context of history and society, making it even an uh, ever-breathing, ever-living, ever-changing contract that we bargain and renegotiate through civic action. Inscribed on the Jefferson Memorial is a quote. Thomas Jefferson said, quote, I am not an advocate for frequent changes in laws or constitutions, but laws and institutions must go hand in hand with the progress of, human, of the human mind. As that becomes more developed, more enlightened, as new discoveries are made, new truths discovered, and manners and opinions change, with the change of circumstances, institutions must advance also to keep pace with the times. The Constitution has endured because of its room for creativity, not in spite of it. Without invention, there is stagnation. And without progress, we could not achieve today's freedoms. When the Constitution was written, I was considered three-fourths, three-fifths of a person and locked out of the personal liberties granted to us in the Bill of Rights. As the nation expanded, slavery was the central concern in admitting states into the Union. Would freedom really be for everyone? 
We have the benefit and the wisdom of history because we can learn from our founding fathers' humanity as well as their biases. While some may not have intended to include me in the rights that our Constitution provides, generation by generation, we summoned its higher purpose and fought for our right to be included in We the People. Civil rights leader and Congresswoman Barbara Jordan described the three-word opener as an eloquent beginning, but added, I felt many years that somehow George Washington and Alexander Hamilton just left me out by mistake. But through the process of amendment, interpretation, and court decision, I have finally been included in We the People. And history provides us context for the very progression, that very struggle. Coretta Scott King described it as a never-ending process. Freedom is never really won. You earn it and win it every generation. In short, it's citizenship that grows, molds, and lifts our constitution and society to higher heights. It's the people who engage in our political process and the people who stand when others sit. Today, just as it was then, the people drive progress. When I think of the numbers 13, 14, 15, and 19, they are more than just numbers to me. Here's what I think of. 13, my right not to be enslaved. 14, my right to equal protection and due process under the law. 15, my father's right to vote. And 19, my right to vote. Yeah. All of those rights were hard fought and they were also calls to civic action. And in a not so distant past reminds us that without it, we would not have those rights. For many, the generations of struggle that continue to this day are sewn into our identities and the fabric of our nation. When deciding to run for Congress, I saw a country divided, a country that despite its high ideals and purpose was caught in a cycle of finger pointing and yelling, D versus R. D versus R. Though we exist in a two-party system, I ran on rejecting the premise that this was a zero-sum game, that we can accomplish more like the numbers 13, 14, 15, and 19 suggest by bringing people together and tackling the big picture issues that face our nation. We have an at-large seat in Delaware, and I take that responsibility seriously. I represent a whole state, and I promise that if elected, I would take us all to Washington. Together, we made history, and serving you has been the honor of my lifetime. Some people even ask, why are you still smiling? <laughs> but it is the honor of my lifetime. I carry your stories with me to Washington. I carry my stories. And many of you know, I carry this scarf with me. This scarf is a reminder. When I was about to take my oath, my sister Thea had done research on our family and found a voter registration card, a card that allowed our great, great, great grandfather, a slave in Georgia, to have the right to vote, a slave who could not write and had to mark an X on that card. We took that card and we turned it into this scarf. Returns of qualified voters and reconstruction oath. His X is down at the bottom. I carry this everywhere I go because it reminds me of where we've come from. It reminds me that I'm the great, great, great granddaughter of a slave. And today, I stand before you as the first woman and the first person of color to represent the first state in Congress. We have overcome. We, this is proof. This is proof, and I carry it with me. Every day I am reminded of that, that that slave is one of 
12,500, that I'm one of 12,500 individuals in human history, 12,500, to take an oath of office to uphold and defend the Constitution and serve the United States Congress. The scarf reminds me that we can overcome because we have. For a young country, we face a lot and we've overcome a lot because when it comes down to it, we love this nation. We all strive for a better future. We all believe in the resolve of our people in the face of adversity and the vision that you and I and the millions of Americans are in this together. While this scarf is a symbol of our nation's past, it also reminds me to remain optimistic. As uh, those of you who know me know, it is my nature to be optimistic. Now, I'm not just optimistic. I am a pragmatic optimist. Let's get that straight. And that shapes how I see the Constitution and my role as a member of Congress. Pessimists could see the Constitution as a weapon for failing to provide equal rights to all citizens. But it's optimists who help shape history. We shouldn't weaponize the words of the Constitution to limit the freedom and the liberties of our people. We should use them to empower and promote the cause of justice and to protect the rights of people and create opportunity for the next generation. One of my goals in Congress is to advance equal rights for all, regardless of who you are, who you love, who you look like, what you came from, or how you were born. These are protections worth fighting for and ones that can be won at the ballot box and in the courts. If the voices of everyone in this country are heard, we can achieve great things. Our Constitution has, that, has a process for that. It's called voting. Yes, it's called voting. That's the process. My colleague and renowned civil rights legend and leader, Congressman John Lewis, describes voting as the most powerful nonviolent tool we have. The most powerful nonviolent tool we have. President Lyndon Johnson said, a man without a vote is a man without protection. That's why I see voter suppression policies, gerrymandering, and free-for-all campaign finance laws as the greatest threats to our civil rights in this country. The clarion call of the nation uh, was that people be heard and that people be given the power. If we limit access to the political process, we are betray betraying the very vision the framers had for our future. Now, when I received the invitation to speak, as I said, I was a little nervous because I'm, I'm, I'm not a lawyer and I'm not a professor. And I wanted to bring something different to you. I wanted to bring a different perspective my background and my experiences to this stage. So it goes without saying that my relationship to the Constitution may be different than yours and your relationship to the Constitution may be different than mine. I shared with you my scarf because it colors how I see the world. My ancestors' induction into our citizenry is something I hold dear. It's a reminder that the Constitution is as relevant today as it was then. And it is a reminder that being a citizen of this great country is more important now than ever because we are in historic times. Ladies, gentlemen, children, we are in historic times. Today, we are living history. And right now, civic action holds the keys to the Constitution. We are in the middle of a loud debate over the Second Amendment. We are considering and, for some, reconsidering how much power should reside in the Oval Office. With the backdrop of a Supreme Court nomination, decisions about human rights, voting, and women's rights are important now more than ever. And the country is looking to Congress to come together and step up. I'd say the Constitution is very relevant, and voters think so too. Right now, we are seeing what I call citizenship on steroids. People are stepping up and getting engaged at historic levels. And you can see that right here in Delaware. On a hot summer weekday, a Thursday no less, more Delawareans voted in the state's primary elections than ever before in the history of this state. 
Did you hear me? Last week, was that last week? More people voted in Delaware in that primary than the history of our state on an off day in an off election. That's incredible. That's on steroids. And people across the country are getting engaged in running for office. In particular, the legacy of the 19th Amendment is in good hands. On election day, there is a chance, election day this year, there is a chance that we will elect more than 100 women to the U.S. House of Representatives, a historic total. <laughs> historic. I am so pumped about that. I'm trying to stay dignified, but I'm gonna tell you, that's like a woo, woo, woo. <laughs> Emily's List, an organization dedicated to recruiting, training, and electing pro-choice women, shared some important data. The year prior to 2016, when I was considering running that election, 900 women expressed interest in running, reaching out to Emily's List. This year, this cycle, it is a record 40,000. 40,000 from 900 to 40,000 citizenship on steroids. Our nation is having a moment, a moment where we are realizing our rights, our constitution, and our republic are not just a given. It's a moment where everyday people are thinking about what being a citizen really means. Beyond paying taxes, serving in the military, collecting social security, or punching a ballot every four years. What inspires me is the new generation of leaders, Julia. From the March for Our Lives to hashtag Me Too, you can see the change is coming and that the next generation isn't gonna wait 10, 20, 30 years to make the change that they wanna see. They're doing it today and they're doing it right now. The world is different and the future will be different. To borrow a line from William Shakespeare, What's past is prologue. Citizenship also means something different now, and it means something different for you and me. It means something different to the recent immigrant fleeing violence and seeking refuge, to the parents who want to know that when they put their children on a school bus that they will come home safely, and to the under-resourced communities that have waited far too long for change to reach them. It's different than it was in 1787, for starters, we have smartphones and social media. The founders could have never anticipated the world that we live in and our access to knowledge today. It puts the onus on us. We have a responsibility to stay engaged, to build and shape the government and society that we want to live in. If it's not clear, I'll say it again. I feel that we are living in truly historic times and we need performers, not spectators. We need a team on the field, not on the sidelines. We need to continue to stay engaged and trust that by working together, being conscious of others in the world, appreciating that we all come from different walks of life, but the ultimate destination is the same. And by carry, caring about the decisions that are made, we will build a more prosperous and just life for we the people. Thomas Jefferson said, the Constitution is, of the United States is the result of the collected wisdom of our country. Fortunately, the collected wisdom of today is made up of many diverse voices. The United States has become a better nation because we've listened to that collected wisdom and accepted that there are new fruits on the tree of knowledge every day. We've updated our rule of law social contract, and yes, the Constitution to adjust to the progress of tomorrow. It's why we've done more than just survive as a nation, but thrive. I want to leave you with one challenge, and I want to leave it for all of you, no matter how old you are. And that challenge is to be a lifelong student of the world, a lifelong student. And I say that because that has served me well. Try to speak to each other. Talk to people who don't agree with you. Seek to understand where they're coming from without judgment. Eat everything you can find that's different. Even chitlins, for those of you who have never tried them. 
Listen to all kinds of music. If you can't travel around the world, go to a section of town that you've never been to. We are connected. We are connected to each other and this planet. When we recognize that, we won't see the wars that we see. We will be able to come together. We will be able to live the dream that is so often talked about. Be a lifelong learner on this planet Earth. That is my challenge to you. Explore. Love. We all have our own journeys and stories, and we are all connected. And by remembering that, hopefully, we can leave our world a better place for the next generation of we, the people. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I would, I would love to stay, but some of you may know I have my first debate tonight, and I have a very interesting opponent. I'm going to leave it at that. You can Google it. <laughs> Google it. But thank you so much, and thank you to the university for all that you do for our great state.